Boom. You're yeah. welcome, everyone, for that amazing music. As I said in the chat, I made that myself in 35 seconds via GarageBand. So if you don't like it, too bad, so sad. It is what it is. Um, friends, <laughs> it is good to be with you. This is going to be a great live. Um, I'm mm -hmm. coming to you from my guest bedroom with a thunderstorm outside. So if I suddenly get raptured on this live, I have not been <laughs> raptured. I just lost the power. So and it's just a sign of Satan attacking what is a God ordained thing to happen. So mm -hmm. anyway, am I, am I right, Jen? I think so. I okay, so. cool. Yeah. Um, let's get right into it. Friends, again, great to have you. We're going to be going through some clips that we pulled from a Sean McDowell, Preston Sprinkle conversation. Before I get into those details, I want to introduce my guest. This is Dr. Jennifer Bird uh, coming to us. Where, where are you coming from, Jen? I want to know. Roanoke, Virginia. Oh, Virginia. Okay, very yeah. cool. Now, Mountains. I have had you on the podcast before uh, mm -hmm. talking about why you don't want a biblical marriage, and we had a very fascinating conversation and then when i saw this video from preston and sean i thought i know a scholar who might be good <laughs> to talk about this so jen why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself kind of give us some of your your background what you're studying etc and then we'll we'll hop into it okay sounds good thanks um yeah and thanks for having me on again i was i loved it when you reached out you're like let's do this i'm like oh yeah i love that you <laughs> thought of me thank you so much of course i yeah so yeah the quick thing right my education so people who you know didn't see me before or hear hear me on when i was on before so i do i have i was a math major undergrad went into ended up at seminary so because of the biblical languages i wanted to i was a missionary kind of person for a while i was very conservative almost fundamentalist in terms of the way i read scripture wow. yeah, yeah yeah i was um i was on staff with young life um very involved in that actually for six or seven years yeah started new clubs you know the whole whole nine yards and um yeah so i have a young life past and my time there i had a very literalistic reading of the scriptures and so i ended up going to seminary because i wanted to study the biblical languages for myself and then when i got to seminary i also started learning about all these other things so that kind of led to these bigger picture and and then i decided to go on to phd work partly be mostly because i'm a teacher at heart and i wanted to have some some power behind me for people to take me seriously when I did start doing some teaching about like, hey, this is what the Bible's talking about and it might not be what you thought it was and it's not what I thought it was, you know, and here's how I came to that conclusion and I'd like to share that with you. So I ended up doing PhD work, um, finished at Vanderbilt, so grateful to be there. Um, and then, so what brings me to this particular conversation and why this is really in my wheelhouse right now when I, my first teaching position is in North Carolina at Greensboro College. And while I was in North Carolina, this vote came up about that essentially Amendment 1 for the U.S., for the state constitution was going to change, pre present something new that was essentially indirectly going to mm. define marriage as between a man and a woman. Mm. So I got involved as a biblical scholar. I'd start going to conversations about it before the vote and start watching all these people and watching what's going on. And I was like, you know, people are making this about what they think God ordained from the beginning, meaning yeah. Genesis. And they don't actually know what the, the scriptures that they're referring to say. They just have been told that they say a certain mm. thing. And they're really, really committed to upholding what scripture says. And I remember this one moment, and it will, I kind of hope, remain with me for all my days because it was profound for me. This young woman who had been a student of mine, who was a lesbian, and, mm. and openly so, and a Christian, right? And she's standing in front of this older man, white man, who was very kind, and he's a pastor. And I just remember the two of them standing there, and she was crying. And she was saying, why would you deny me this? And he didn't respond. And my sense was, it was out of his hands. It's what the scripture says. And so there's nothing for him to be doing. And that's, and I, and I, so I could read both people. I under, I could identify with both positions, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, like I had mm -hmm. held both positions. And so right. anyway, that's, so that was in 2012. And I've been doing this kind of work ever since. I'm interested not in convincing someone of something. I'm interested in helping people understand what the biblical passages do and don't say. Yeah. First, let's just be like, painfully honest right right first and then you can figure out what you're going to do with it 
So yeah. that's what I've been doing for the last 10, 12 years is working. You know, I got to speak at a United Methodist Church, their kind of progressive segment. I got to keynote for them at a conference. And after the conference, when someone said, you gave us a lot of information, but I just need to sit with it myself and one bite at a time and work through it. So I've been working on how do I do that? How can I help people do that slowly, safely in a yeah. way that they can process it for themselves? I'm not right. No one, no one changes their mind or even considers something new when they're feeling defensive yes. or unsafe. Right. And so, yeah, so that's the work I've been trying to do. I created a video series about this. I just wrote a book that'll be coming out in a couple months. Oh, about is this. it? So, is it this book? Boom! Oh, it is! <laughs> Marriage in the Bible. What do the tech? Look, I got all queued up for you, Jen. So this book is coming out. It's coming out at the end of this year. Is that correct? Uh, early November, mid November. Early November. Yeah, like yeah. So yeah. yeah, very close. A couple months now. Yeah. It's available for pre-order on Amazon, all the good places. I'll make sure at the end of this live for our show notes that we put a link there so folks can go ahead and pre-order it. But this is one of the reasons why I asked you on because you are a biblical scholar and you're studying this stuff. Like you are really yeah. trying to understand. So what we're going to do, friends, is we're going to we're going to respond to a few clips that we pulled from a conversation between Preston Sprinkle and Sean McDowell. And I have a few caveats I, I want to preface this conversation with. First off, I do believe that Preston and Sean are both good faith actors, meaning mm -hmm. I don't think mm -hmm. that they have some nefarious purpose or that or that they're being um, uh, dishonest with themselves or with their audience. I, I've interviewed both of them. I talked to Sean and Preston before this. They know that we're doing this conversation and they both said, great, can't wait to see what you say. Make sure you send them my way so we can watch it. So, you know, it's important that as we're going through this, that we really don't dehumanize folks that maybe we even strongly disagree with and believe that that particular theological perspectives can cause harm to people. I don't want to, I don't want to gloss over that. You know, there's a reason why we take this very seriously. Um, I also want to say that we can't respond to every argument that they present in this video. It's an hour and a half long podcast. And I learned from my uh, conversation with Billy Hoare two weeks ago that if a 45 minute converse, a podcast took us an hour and a half to go through piece by mm -hmm. piece, Mm -hmm. an hour and a half podcast we might be raptured for real by then you know jen so <laughs> so so our goal is really to pick up one or two of the core themes that they say underpins all the other arguments that they have for what they would say is affirming a traditional biblical marriage perspective and we want to mm -hmm. kind of address that root and then ask the question on well is this from our take accurate and the last thing i want to say about this is Sometimes people think that if someone is more progressive or more of a critical biblical scholar, that somehow they don't take the Bible seriously. That's a misnomer. Mm -hmm. I argue that we mm -hmm. are doing this because we take the Bible seriously. And what I mean by that is that we want to take the Bible on its own terms as best as we know how, and then we can figure out what do we do with it? How do we interpret it? How do we make sense of it for today in our context? And by the way, if someone's out there watching this like, oh, that sounds super progressive or liberal or postmodern, mm -hmm. every every tradition does this. We all negotiate mm -hmm. text, right? There's a reason why, we're, why, why the evangelical church alone is divided over women in leadership, right? They see the same right. text differently. So we're yes. just participating in that same conversation, but we are talking about something marriage in a way that might surprise you when we really start getting into the nitty gritty and examining the text that I think will show where you and I and Preston and Sean really diverge and why that has implications. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of set the stage. This is all about a good faith conversation. So any, any, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, questions for me, Jen, or anything you want to say before we kind of hop right into it and, and go to the first clip or what are your thoughts? Yeah. On? Two things I did want to highlight and I, Absolutely. I, I love the fact that I know that they're listening or they're going to watch like I that helps keep me keep it real. You mm -hmm. know, not that it wouldn't have been, but it's more like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. It's like, oh, yeah. Anyway. OK, right. so I like that. I also there are two things I want to comment on. One, I really appreciated when at the near the beginning of their conversation, when Preston was saying, you know, when I talk with people, I ask them to try to get to the point where they can wrap their head around this other idea. And he said it maybe a little differently than I do, but I, I literally put that on my syllabi. Like I, this mm -hmm. is, I have a paraphrase from Aristotle. It's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain an idea without accepting it. Like mm. that is, that defines my teaching philosophy. You don't have to agree with this, um, but can you articulate it? And to be able to do that, you have to acknowledge your own beliefs, yeah. set them aside 
and then consider something new. And so that's, yeah. to me, that's how education works. That's how like transformation works is just slowly considering. So I appreciated that he said that because I was like, yeah, I do that too. And I respect that. The other thing I wanted to highlight very quickly, and then we'll get into the content is, is that I agreed with um, at least four of the points that they made in terms of, yeah, those are really lousy arguments. So <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. I'm like, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm with you. That's a yeah, apples and oranges or whatever. I'm like, yep, with you. Yep. Le next, next. That's not even helpful to get into, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, the other thing, just to bring it back to what they were bringing it back to and bring it back to you in this conversation, the reason my book is called Marriage in the Bible and not Same Sex Marriage in the Bible is because I think that is the root issue. What yeah. does the Bible actually say about marriage? What do we find in the Bible? about marriage yes. what are people who take these scriptures very seriously being taught to think about marriage and so for me that goes beyond just one passage or two passages it goes it's the whole kit and caboodle what's yeah. actually going on here great all right let's yeah. get into our first clip hopefully this play is right if not we'll have to do it again here we go okay <laughs> okay it's not working <laughs> oh no literally wait. right off oh the wait i know why it's not working here we go watch the right. work here Boop. That's not it either. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you all it was working ahead of time. I okay. have it. Oh, I have it right here. I'm, I'm going to pull it in. Give me a second, friends. I, it was working, but you know, the devil is just, it's complete. Uh, we're being attacked here. Let me pull this up. <laughs> this is the one. I'm stalling. And, and yeah. ultimately, I mean, I'm not going to lie. You know, I, I do think the historic Christian position on marriage um, is true and accurate. And I think mm. some people might be questioning that because it's like, I don't know, I know this really smart person that said this or that argument. So I do hope that it does um, uh, bolster people's faith in uh, both the scriptures and what the scripture teaches about marriage. Hmm. I love that. Now, you and I are firmly committed to the historic Christian view, and we hope in a sense to advance that because we think it's right and we think it's biblical. Right. All right, so that, that's the first claim, is that what they are advancing is the historic Christian view of marriage. Now, I know there's kind of a second part to this clip that ties into what we're going to talk about. I'm not sure if you got something you want to add here or play the second clip, and we can go from there. It's up to you. Well, yeah, I want to comment right now briefly, and that is um, go ahead. The, uh, the only thing we're given from them is that what they come out and say at various points, which is marriage one of the more important parts, they don't say it solely, but they say the more important things is that sex difference is a part of marriage. But the thing is, they don't ever actually fully define what they think the historic Christian tradition is that is true and accurate. And so if it's more than that, than just sex difference, I would have liked to have heard that. But even if we're just going to stick with sex difference as a part of marriage, their own arguments in the rest of the podcast um challenge that hmm. because they um well not just that that's what part of that's marriage but that marriage itself isn't as super important as the rest of you know that the sacred and essential it's not actually sacred in the bible and it isn't essential because they even have an argument where they're saying singleness is a light is a legitimate option for people mm -hmm. so 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 there's that but but in terms of opinions on marriage, even scripturally speaking, Jesus isn't positive on marriage. Paul prefers celibacy. And so when they make a claim, when they make a comment, historic Christian tradition, I don't know what they're referring to. Even mm. within the Bible itself, there's a range of opinions about marriage, whether or not it's even good. In fact, Jesus says that it's, it's a hindrance to being a part of the kingdom of God. Hmm. Like that's a uh, big deal. So, yeah. so what is the Christian historical tradition on marriage? It's actually not clear, even just speaking of the Bible. And then we have all the variations throughout history that like, oh yeah, this king got to marry his male lover. Like, and that was endorsed by a bishop. Like, you know. Go ahead. You well, have a question. I, I, I think, I, yeah, I think what they would say, because I've been in those spaces and so have you, is that, well, mm -hmm. what we're talking about is one man, one woman for life, like joined in marriage. That's that's the historic Christian position. I think they're talking even more historically before they get into the biblical argument, per perhaps. So mm -hmm. for you, would you say that like, okay, yeah, like, like, like 
the majority or all of the church tradition has affirmed that to be what marriage is? Is that just kind of murky? You know, one thing I think about a lot is like, does that mean that every marriage is based on love? Like is every marriage based on I'm courting this woman who I love and we're both in love and now we're going to get married because those are other elements that, that kind of define what we think about marriage to be today. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That might not Mm -hmm. be the case Mm -hmm. historically. So that's my only Mm -hmm. thought about that. Yeah, and I think that the I think it's a that's an appropriate pushback, and I appreciate that. The one piece that I will return to then is the issue of it being sacred and essential, which they say elsewhere, not in this particular clip. Sure. But the concept of marriage being sacred, it actually wasn't legit. It wasn't defined that way until at least the twelfth century, if not the fourteenth. Mm. And it does come from Ephesians five's language that that where you. And I, I have a section in the book where I talk about this, how this developed over time, these, the language around marriage because of the passage in Ephesians 5. So yeah. historically, though, it has not always been seen as sacred, blah, 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 blah. So, okay. you know, I feel, yeah, but Fair. we can keep All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's Good question for you before we jump sure. into these uh, affirming arguments is you claim, and I agree with you 100% on this, that the key issue involves not five or six particular passages in the Bible, which we may get into, but the definition of marriage. Yeah. What is the historic Christian view of marriage, and why does Scripture support that view in your view? Yeah. Here you go, definition. It's fascinating how many people engage this conversation and don't understand that, that the fundamental question in the same-sex sexuality conversation is what is marriage specifically i guess to even make it even more specific is is sex difference male female biological Mm. sex difference is that a necessary part of what marriage is not are most marriages between male and female everybody's going to agree with that but the essence of what marriage is when we say the word marriage is that a union between two consenting adults or specifically two consenting adults who are of who are different, who are sexed differently, male and female. That's really the heart of the question. And, and yeah, I think some people skip over that question and go to the prohibition passages. And I think that's just um, <clears throat> starting off on the wrong foot. So, Okay, so I'm going to just summarize that. Essentially what Preston says to that question of what is definition is that a key or essential part of that, at least according to the Bible, is sex difference is required, meaning one man and one woman who are in some kind of union. What's mm-hmm. your take on this? Well, he did. I I agree. I agree. That's what he said. And he doesn't actually fully define it again, which is interesting because I think that they are avoiding something important by not fully defining it for us. Hmm. But they're saying, but he said instead, but this is an important question, which is, is sex different an essential part of it? Okay. So we can even just, just to acknowledge that that's what we're doing is important to me because I still don't actually know what they think the definition of marriage is, even after watching this multiple times. Um, But I will push back on his comment about, is marriage about two consenting adults or is it about two consenting adults who are sexed differently? And there is no reason to suggest that the biblical marriage, that marriage as talked about, as represented, as legislated, as talked about by Jesus, is entered into by two consenting adults. We can just start there, much less for the sake of love. But he didn't say that. I don't think Preston and Sean are saying that, but it is how people tend to think of it today. But marriage is never entered into by two equals consenting for love anywhere in the Bible. We need to, can we unpack that for a minute? Yeah, I sure. think this is kind of the part where we have to, okay, so <laughs> the claim is that um, marriage, as how Preston and Sean think it is in the Bible, at least involves consenting adults and sex right. difference. You're saying mm-hmm. consent is not a key ingredient in, in the biblical view of marriage. Can you give us not some examples, unpack some of that? Like, where do you want sure. to start with that big claim? <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't it's know. a big one. <laughs> um, yeah, where do we want to start? We could start with, um, we could start with just talking about the Hebrew Bible. There isn't, hmm, I didn't know we'd go here now, but that's fine because this is good. I like it. Um, There isn't a verb to marry in the Hebrew Bible. So about 90% of the time, if you're looking at an English translation of a passage in the, what most people call Old Testament, I prefer to call it Hebrew Bible. Sure. If you're looking at a passage and it says, he, you know, do not marry foreign women, 90% of the time that's going to actually say, do not take 
foreign women. It's going to be the verb lakach to take. Mm. Um, we have, I have a list again in one of my chapters. I talk about this, but I can reference them briefly right now if that would be helpful in this. You mean this, this list right here? <laughs> Well, actually, <laughs> that's one of my charts. Yes. Yeah, I, um, I have this one. And I have this one. We can start at either one. Yeah. We let's go with the take versus. This is a good one. Um, okay. The top. So, um, yeah, sure. That first one. Lot. So I just offered two different translations of the same passage in that particular mm. row, and those are English translations, right? So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, which is again, I don't want to get into that, but that that's a weird way to translate since we don't have marriage according to law, but doesn't matter who were to marry his daughters or the NIV says who were pledged to marry and a different one said, and I think in their footnote, they said, or were married to his daughters already. Mm. Um, but, but certainly the English translation there is saying, is saying they're, they're going to marry, they're pledged to marry. They were already married. But if you look in the right hand column and I don't expect people to be able to understand the Hebrew script there, but it's there for those who like to follow along in some sort of visual way with the with the lettering and whatever. But my very wooden translation of the Hebrew is they will take his daughters. And if you just look down this chart, we don't have to go through each one one by sure. one, but you can see that in the left hand column, you know, you shall not marry one of the Canaanite women the phrase in the Hebrew is do not take. It doesn't, it isn't marry. It's mm. do not take. And, uh, you know, you could even just very slowly, if you wanted to like scroll down this chart, you can see, let us take their daughters in marriage and let us give them our daughters. And it's let us take them and give them. There's no marrying. The, mm. the language of marry is being Im imposed upon these passages. It's not in the Hebrew itself. And this goes for the verb, the language around what verbing they're doing, you know, marrying or whatever. Yeah. So in, in other words, we could remove from the Old Testament passages, the Hebrew Bible passages, the language of marrying and replace it with take. Or we have a couple other verbs, truly three or three other verbs, you know, that are sometimes used in the Hebrew to refer to this thing that we call marrying. Yes, we do. But they didn't. They had a different way of referring to it. They called it taking or take, and, and the lakaching taking is they're going to pay for her, right? A man goes and pays for this woman, pays her father for the, you know, for her. But there's a ver there's a version of it where you just take by force, nasa, right? And both Malan and Chilion do that in the book of Ruth. We have one other fairly common one, but it's only in Ezra and Nehemiah is this reference, a different verb, yashav. And it's a form of a verb that's like a forcing someone to live with you for a certain amount of time or whatever. Mm. And that's, that's used again, that's in, um, I have one reference that I've pulled because I realized I didn't have it in a chart in Ezra chapter 10. And it's multiple times in that chapter. What the quote here is Shechaniah, son of Jehiel of the descendants of Elam addressed Ezra saying, we have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women, but they haven't married them. It's we have dwelt with them. Hmm. So what's happening, at least from my perspective around the verbs, and then we'll talk about the nouns here in just a second, is that we're being, we're being prompted to think in terms of our current ideas about marriage when we read these ancient texts because the translation oh thank you you're welcome i should have I'm, given you I'm a moment because you're, you're right yeah there you're you, you told me you would um you know we're being prompted to think of it this way because the translation committees have made the choice to t when they see the verb lecoq in some moments they will translate it as mary because today we would call that marrying, but they mm. didn't call it that. And the other chart, there are two charts there together that you pulled mm -hmm. up. The other is a ver is an example of when that same verb, lakach, is translated as take consistently in the English translations, mm. right? And they're pretty powerful examples, right? Take, you know, or, you know, we need to kick them out of the garden or else they might take from the tree of life, right? That's right. That's take, right? Here's your woman in, you know, when they're in Egypt in chapter 12 of Genesis, take her and go, right? Like, yep, yeah, this is your woman, wife in the English, but it's woman in the Hebrew. 
right? God said, take your son when he's talking to Abraham about potentially sacrificing Isaac. Take it, right? right? I mean, this right. is the same verb. It is okay. take. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. I'm, I'm tracking what you're saying, and I'm going to okay. repeat it for all of us folks who, you know, are... <laughs> A couple of notches beneath all this, right? What I'm hearing you say is like, listen, there really is no maybe direct correlation for the word marry. It's the word yes. take that has yeah. different meanings. But in the Hebrew Bible, is there a process that someone would call in their own way married, right? Like, uh, like, like, like when Jacob marries Rachel, isn't that implying like there's there's some ceremony, there's something before God happening? That's no, I no, mean, no. Or, no. Or, or is that just like no. not? Because I remember Rob Je Bell talking about underneath the the hookah or something like hoopa. that. There's some kind, hoopa. yeah, hoopa, yeah. There's a whole sermon that he did, and I was like, ooh, this is so romantic. I should do this, which is totally like horrible. I didn't do it, but I was like 12, you know, think, oh, I want to be more biblical, so we'll do like what the Hebrews did, you know, which is so it's so unhealthy for so many reasons. But that idea at least in my head, signals like ceremony, something is happening that's official, that maybe isn't a one-to-one -one correlation of marriage, but still involves marriage. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And there isn't a ceremony anywhere in the Hebrew Bible. Okay. Um, there aren't any ceremonies in the Newer Testament. There are only the celebration of of the coming together. That's all, We get the what we would call a reception. Just to be clear with Jacob, he you know they say... Laban calls together people to celebrate. They have a big feast. And then um, Laban puts the wrong daughter in the bed and Jacob goes in and has sex with her. Like, that is it. There isn't a sacred moment, a ritual. Maybe there was a ritual, but we don't know anything about it. They're mm. not talking about it. They're not giving us any hint that that's a thing. It's just, hey, uh, I'm giving my, my girl to this guy. Come celebrate with us. And then right. what, how they know, how we all know as a community that these two belong together now is because he has, he has had sex with her. She now belongs to him. Mm. And that's another element in the bigger picture here from my perspective is so many people today do think of marriage and sex inter in an intertwined kind of a way. And it's yeah. in part because biblical texts only give us that to work with, I think. Hmm. Um, but that's another conversation that okay. we will get to here in a minute. One so, last point on this. Just, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. I don't want to nope. cut you off. Okay. Well, just to, just you one, go. one last thought. Um, are you saying that base? I want you to spell it up bluntly because I'm, I'm imagining, let's say Sean and Preston are listening to this, right? And I want yeah, to treat this course. fairly. Are, is the claim you're making that based on all the research you've done and available evidence that, that the idea of consent is never a thing in the Hebrew Bible. And it's always a man says, you woman. And the woman goes, well, I have no choice. It doesn't matter if I if I like you or not, I'm going to get Correct. married. I'm going to get married to you. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Thank you. So there is, we when you get to the story of Isaac and Rebecca, Rebecca seems pretty, pretty jazzed, but, but I would come back with your point. Like, What's her, what are her options? Get on board with it or or what? Off yourself. Like she doesn't have a choice and she might mm. as well make the best of it. Sure. That's great. Right. Mm. Um, we can see that Michal is rather fond of David, but he isn't fond of her. Interesting. Whatever. Just to note. But the but the more important thing from my perspective is those are the only two that we even have them represented. Women don't. I'm taking it down a notch here. So calm. <laughs> Women, <laughs> you're doing great. Be you. I'm like, be oh, you. I can go off. <laughs> um, Women don't get a say in these things, right? They, you know, and women are talked about, right? Like Rachel and Leah are talked about. Uh, Jacob works for them for 14 years, but they don't. We don't know what either of them think about it. W they are mentioned as the things that he works for. And by the way, if it's really telling when you look at what Jacob says after seven years, he's like, all right. Uh, my time working for the working for her is done. I give me my woman so I can go into her, right? Mm -hmm. That is the that's what it's you know. I'm like, oh my god. Um, so consent, mm -hmm. it's they're not given a voice. Mm -hmm. Much less half the time they're not even named. Women aren't necessarily mm -hmm. named. It's just that a man, you know, go get me a woman. 
um, go, you know, Samson talks to his parents, go get that woman for me. She pleases me. Like what? Mm -hmm. You just got a hard on when you looked at her? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like get her for me. She pleases me. That is it. Go, you know, go purchase her. We don't know if that woman was game for this marriage. We don't know. And it doesn't matter according to that biblical story. Mm -hmm. We, we don't get the women's perspectives, voices, any of that. So, we, so we can't speak to whether or not they were excited about it or supportive. Yeah. And I think that's a very important element of biblical passages of biblical of scriptures is that we don't know. And that didn't matter. This is telling us something important about the scriptures, about the worldview that the Bible embodies. Fair. Um, okay. So, so far what we have in this conversation, remember the whole point of this is just to see what can we glean from the Bible regarding this idea of marriage. So yes. far, I think it's safe to say that based on what you're telling me in your research, this version of marriage compared to what we're used to are already very different. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Regarding the relationship, the consent involved, even the ceremony yeah. process, right. you know, right. uh, the idea of pursuing someone. These are not there's, this is not a one to one ratio. Um, no courting going enough. on. Right, yeah. right. But, but, what? but, oh, God. No, go ahead. But <laughs> sex difference is an ingredient. Oh, totally. So far, no question. That is a part for sure. Cool. Got it. It is a part. I have one other thing to say before you go to the next clip, which yes. is the other thing, which is not just the verbs that say, you know, we're, you know, take her and marry, don't marry foreign people. Don't, you know, marrying, marrying, marrying. It's also the lang the labels for both men and women. So within the Hebrew Bible, this is true, both Testaments. Do we have a, no, you're good. Someone you, needing we, to join no matter, the conversation. No matter again? what, you keep going. All right. You okay. don't stop. <laughs> Um, right. If you're raptured, we're good. Okay, yeah, just, so, just roll. Yeah, just keep going. So um, this, I have to be honest, I think this one hit me harder than the verb did when I first observed it. And so um, they're within both Testaments, primary Testaments for Christians in their Bible, right? Old Testament, New Testament, what I prefer to call Hebrew Bible, Newer Testament. They're, the nouns involved are all just man and woman. There isn't a different noun to designate once they're married in our language. Oh. Yeah. So, so when you see anywhere, anywhere, and I mean anywhere in your Bible, the reference to husband or wife, just tuck away in the back of your mind that actually in the original language, they're just saying man and woman. And I have, I, I, did I share any of those charts with you? Um, I might not have, I, yeah, I'm not sure that I did because I wasn't, mm, you keep talking. I'll see if I can, if I can. Okay. Okay, okay. Cause what, cause what that would be is I had, um, like, you know, Genesis three, you know, it's, it's every now and then there's, it's actually really powerful when you look at the newer Testament examples, like first Corinthians seven and, um, Ephesians, but I may not have shared those with you. So that's my fault. I, think I got but, something, uh, hold on. You, yeah, I have just, uh, uh, I'm looking here. Oh, I do actually have it. Let me pull. Let me get them formatted as as you're talking. So go ahead. And oh, okay, on. okay. So yeah. So so for instance, and this is where kind of the rubber meets the road in terms of really engaging Sean and Preston. I hope it's okay. I refer to them by first names. I haven't met them. I, I think but, it's okay. Okay. Um, that and and tr truly, this felt like a gut punch to me, or like something big. Uh, when I first realized this in Genesis two twenty four, which is one, which is essentially the primary kind of the linchpin for Preston, and with good reason, hmm. um, the the Hebrew there in verse twenty three says, you know, this this one shall be called woman, for out of man she's taken. So in twenty three, we have Ish and Isha. Um, for the first time, we have male and female or man and a woman. And then the next verse says, therefore, a man shall leave his parents and cling to his Isha, which is woman. Right. But every single English translation I have consulted calls her a wife. Yes. I had the clip of that. Should we play the clip so we can get into sure. that part? Because that's one awesome. of his big arguments. This is Genesis 22, 24. Here we go. Yeah, I do believe that when the Bible does talk about marriage, um, it either explicitly teaches or sometimes uh, assumes that sex difference is a part of what 
marriage is. Um, and the Bible, you know, there's a phrase that it uses based on Genesis 2.24, which I, I think we're going to get into, um, that, the, you know, the father, um, or, you know, uh, he shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two will become mm-hmm. one flesh. That idea of becoming one flesh is the biblical way of talking about marriage. It's quoted in uh, Matthew 19, Ephesians 5, and other passages. And I do think that when the Bible does talk about that specific uh, union, um, that sex difference is a necessary part of what that is. Okay. So, by the way, here's your graph. I, I, it's a little sloppy, friends, but I wanted to pull them up. So this is what you were referring to, I think, with the Let's woman see. translated as woman, woman translated as wife, That's right. mm-hmm. woman translated as wife, and then the the, mm-hmm. the charts that you had. So this is kind of some mm-hmm. of what you were talking about, right? It is. And then I had another chart where I just did a comparison of the English translation of like First Corinthians 7, and then my translation where I'm reflecting that the Greek doesn't have married or husband wife language, which I don't think I shared those with you. But gotcha. yes, what you just shared is important because the, the there are times when woman in the Hebrew is translated as woman across the board. Everybody mm. agrees, right? And mm. then there are times when every English translation will choose to call her wife because in our terms, yeah. right? that's a coupled situation yeah Um, so obviously one of the big arguments i mean one of the strongest arguments that i hear always is like well the creation account like in the creation account it is emphatically clear (laughs) that a man leaves his parents and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh and i will be honest you know i just always in my head assumed that there was some kind of like I mean, I didn't, I didn't know what it looked like, but some kind of Jewish ceremony of like, and now you, mm-hmm. Adam, take you, Eve. Now, there are a lot of issues now for this with me, mainly, and this is my, my personally, which is my view. I'm not asking anyone to subscribe to how I see this, but mm-hmm. Genesis 1 and 2 are two different creation accounts and very metaphorical. So even taking the Adam and Eve as literal historical figures for me already has an issue, but I can still mm-hmm. get beyond and say, okay, the metaphor is that God mm-hmm. has designed marriage to be between one man and one woman for life. And then Preston cites Genesis mm-hmm. 2.24, mm-hmm. a very common mm-hmm. piece of scripture. Do you want me to play it again so you can hear it again, or, or are you good and you want, you want to go and just, just respond to it? I can just respond to it. Did you want to play it again for people watching? Let's do it one more time because I did kind yeah. of I did kind of veer off. So let's go back into that just so we were very yeah. clear. Yeah. yeah, I do believe that when the Bible does talk about marriage, um, it either explicitly teaches or sometimes uh, assumes that sex difference is a part of what marriage is. Um, and the Bible, you know, there's a phrase that it uses based on Genesis 2.24, which I, I think we're going to get into, um, that, the you know, the father... Um, or, you know, uh, shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two will become mm-hmm. one flesh. That idea of becoming one flesh is the biblical way of talking about marriage. It's quoted in uh, Matthew 19, Ephesians 5, and other passages. And I do think that when the Bible does talk about that specific uh, union, um, that sex difference is a necessary part of what that is. Okay, so the claim is that, hey, this one flesh thing, by definition, necessitates sex difference, and it's outlined very clearly right here in Genesis uh, you know, 2.24, for this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh, which now we know, thanks to your work, is united to his woman, mm-hmm. right? It's not and necessarily verse, wife. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the same in verse five, 25, the man and his woman were both naked and they were not ashamed. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. The floor is yours. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> because here's the thing, you, you know, as you said, yeah, it, sex difference is is always a part of marriage or what we would call marriage when we see it in the Bible. That is true. Mm-hmm. So here's the, so, so I'm not deny, and, and even Preston said that, like, well, according to the Bible, we only see couples, hetero couples, right? I mean, that's the thing. So there, so part of what's going on here from my perspective is how much weight we are giving or how much are we expecting that this is what God ordained from the beginning? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is what God ordained. So, so for instance, this took me a while. I have to, to be honest with you about that, Tim. It took me yeah. a while to kind of unpack this very deeply ingrained view that I had, right? I mean, there were times not even that many years ago where I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I was reading marriage onto this thing just because sex is involved. But sex being involved is not the same thing as marriage. 
and why okay. right for most people you're you're thinking i'm crazy <laughs> i'm listening right. open mind I know. open mind i appreciate I'm here. that so here's the thing I, I yeah thank you i appreciate that you said okay chapter one and two are two different stories and they're kind of metaphorical right what i what i found i had to do is get to a place where i don't need scripture to defend anything that i believe i'm trying to just look at it for what it is saying and that took me a long time mm. and so there's that i'm gonna put that out there the other yeah. piece is what are these two stories up to are they you know is the is genesis one focused in on defining marriage is that what Genesis 127 and 28 is trying to do is define marriage? Or are those, is that story about something in a sense, a lot bigger? You know, we're talking about the creation of the world. We're talking about order in the creation. We're talking about, you know, you know, sea, animal, birds, uh, humans, all the creatures. And God tells the, the, you know, the sea creatures to be fruitful, and multiply. God tells the land animals and humans to be fruitful, and multiply. And then, you know, like, make sure you're just eating vegetation, by the way. And like, you know, all that great stuff, right? Is Genesis 1 about marriage? I don't think so. But I understand why people want to read it that way, because we see, you know, because God is telling them to be fruitful and multiply. But God is also telling the birth that all the animals to be fruitful and multiply. Is every, are all animals getting married? No. What's happening is our own view of things is essentially kind of trumping what we're going to see there. Hmm. And so when I read be fruitful and multiply i all like until just a couple years ago okay i just immediately brought in marriage because god is telling to, them to be fruitful and multiply of course they're married because you have to have sex to be fruitful and so of course they're married but that isn't what the story is about mm. it's what we want it to be about because we're more comfortable if they're already married before they start getting busy right mm. same is true in genesis 2 what what is helpful for me is to try to take a few cues from literary studies or just from our english our english teachers in high school what is this story up to hmm. what is it trying to speak to because i think whether you think of scripture as you know god breathed in every word as, as some people do or you see it as inspired literature wherever you are in that spectrum right um what is it up to well, it's if you look at it, it starts out with this first creature who is not male, by the way. It's just a generic human. Um, mm -hmm. And God says... The human, it's, right? Is that the... It's yeah. generic. Yep, just the human, right. Um, and so God says, it's not good that this human is alone. Yeah, good job. Good job. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, it doesn't say, hey, we need to get this guy married. Mm. It says, it's not good that this creature is alone. Wait, can I pull this up? Are you talking about about, sure. about this right here, this passage? The Lord God also said <laughs> it is not good Actually, for the man to be alone. I need you to back up even higher in the story. That's part of the point here. The whole chapter in verse five. Right here. Seven, verse seven. Oh, when, seven. let's see, sorry. Right here. Shrub of the field. Then God formed the, formed the human and it's instead of man, it should say, I say ha-adam. And uh, yeah, God formed Adam from the Adama, the dust from the ground, and breathed, did a little CPR, right? Breathed mm -hmm. into its nostrils, and the human became a living being. And then we get the thing about Garden of Eden, and then, oh, yep, no, you're right. I'm sorry. It is. Hang on. Yeah, scroll down. I'm sorry. I I got just I got distracted. You're right. Yes, it was verse 18. So we have this whole thing. We've got the human. We've got the ground. We got the rivers. We got the thing. And then yes, God says it's not good that the human is alone. I'm going to make it a, a suitable helper. And that, woo, that must be NIV. I'm like, oh. mm. <laughs> I'm going to make a part, a help, a partner as it's equal is how I translate that phrase in Hebrew, because it's Azer Konegdo. It's some, it's a, it's an Azer, which is elsewhere, you know, the psalmist cry out to God, my Azer. Yeah. Helper, sure, helper, but strong, you know, and then Konegdo is before him. So face to face and you only look equals in the face regardless. Uh, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
it's not good that this human is alone. I'm going to make it unequal as its partner. That's what we've got going on. That's the issue here is that aside from people who are not, who are asexual, well, not even asexual, because a lot of asexual people still want relationships in, you know, intimate right. relationships. Um, but most humans, not all, but most humans on the planet are interested in a life part or interested in partnership, a life partner. And I'm not just using partner because it's the cool, it's a progressive way of talking about. No, right. I literally mean a companion, right? This store, this version is really mostly about this human desire for starting our own kinship thing or whatever, and having the person that we're spending our time with, right? The language of marriage isn't in there. There isn't, you know, God isn't saying we need to get him married. God is saying humans need, right? Humans need each other. They, mm. and, and it's a story that says, you know, uh, I've had parents in my classrooms who say, this is either a way to help soften the blow for moms who, for parents who don't want to let their children go, or it's a way to kick the one out of the nest who won't leave home, right? Like it's time, get it, it's, you know, go do your own thing. But that to me is different than saying, this is God defining marriage. Mm. I see this as a story that's talking about a, an element of human, nearly universal human experience, right? Mm -hmm. But that's different than saying God is ordaining from the beginning that marriage be this. I just want to say, take a, take a deep breath and take a step back and let it be a lot bigger than that, that we're talking about. Mm. Add to that, the Hebrew doesn't have verbs for marry, or they're still just calling her calling it a man and a woman before and after they get together and become one flesh. And hmm. okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I'm just okay. pondering a lot of this because yep. Yep. you know, just to be transparent, I, I get what you're saying, but then I also think about, and I think Preston goes into this into our next clip. He really highlights like for this reason that 24, a man will leave his father and mother, which to me, even if it's not marriage, does designate some kind of unique relationship that you don't have with most people. So it's like more than just a, hey, me and my brother are, you know, we're we're lifelong together. Like we're friends, we're buddies, we're partners. Obviously, you know, there's a huge boundary there for us, right? When it comes to the, you know, the leave father and mother and they'll become one flesh part. So like, I'm kind of wondering, like, I hear what you're saying, but I don't really know how you get there completely based on that 24. Does that make sense? I do. And I think part of what I'm trying to get at is the difference between people coupling up and people getting married. Got it. I understand. I understand. Okay. Okay. I, that, I understand. Can I, can I, can I repeat, repeat that back? What you're saying please. is that like these texts might talk about people having sex or coupling up. That doesn't mean that they're automatically married, especially in the sense that we think about marriage, the sacred covenant between you, God, and your your spouse for life, monogamously no matter what, you know, et cetera. That, that, that's the difference. That is the difference. And- Okay. Yes. And, okay. you know, you can apply that to, do you respect couples who are living together the same way that you respect a married couple? Do you think that there's a difference there qualitatively in their relationships? Right. I and do. that comes out. Of <laughs> I'm working on trying not to, but Understood. I do, right? Like, I Understood. believe like, oh, and it, when you really, and I know we're a little long-winded folks on this point, but this is very important for us it to is. really hammer home because I have thought about, even before I got to where I am now, like, sure. I don't think Adam and Eve, like, walked down an aisle, had a pastor officially, you know, make a ceremony. I'm not sure if they committed verbally saying, I, I, Adam, will now take you, Eve, as my, you know, no. wife, no. and we signed no. these papers. I don't think it's this, <laughs> the idea, right? But I think what someone, and I don't want to, <clears throat> Preston, if you're reading, if you're watching this, I'm sorry, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm guessing, like, one of the maybe advocates of the the creation account story talks about marriage is that they would say, well, you know, someone becoming, leaving his father and mother, it signifies a different kind of permanent bond because oh, you're cool. leaving and now you're, you're uniting to your wife or your woman, mm -hmm. you know, becoming one flesh mm -hmm. sexually. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. maybe that's where mm -hmm. they would get the lifelong part or even the covenant Agreed. because God was, you know, these, these are in theory were, were the first two humans, you know, depending on how you read it. 
I'm, maybe that's like how you would get there. I, sure, I don't know. Sure. I don't. And I am not denying that. Mm. What I think is important to, con- well, from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I think of things differently. If, if I can say this story is about a human desire for companionship and lifelong partnership. Then if I say this story tells us God ordained marriage between a man and a woman. Yes. It's just that. a different conversation yeah, and way of understanding what this story is up to. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Okay. Let's go on to his next point here. He kind of hammers home the for this reason part. I'll kind of let you respond to it and see okay. what you think. Does that work for you? Sure. Yeah. Back to uh, Genesis 2.23, the previous verse. You know, Adam says, you know, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, a, a, a common human. But then he says... You know, she shall be called woman for she was taken out of man mm. for this reason. And so he goes into, he builds the logic yep. of 223 into 224. It's, it's these two verses form one unit of thought. For this reason, man shall leave his father, mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Well, the they becoming one flesh reaches all the way back to 223 and captures both the full equality of the woman and the difference that she brings to the table. I don't I don't disagree with the whole difference. And I actually think that there's an interesting claim he's making there about their full equality. I do think of it that way personally. Do you have to you have Genesis two that you can pull up for us to yeah. see visually? Oh, of Part- course I do, Jen. Boom. I know you do. So um it's what's so smaller so out of the way thank you yep yep awesome i was just gonna ask for that yeah what's happening from my perspective and this is like either biblical scholar or just like hey let's just take a cue from our high school english professor teachers you know um for this reason that's about that's in response to the whole story when you get to the in, near the end of a story and you've got a therefore blah 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 look to see what it's there for this is what the whole chapter has been building to not just this one verse 23 and actually to say technically speaking to say that 23 and 24 are a unit of thought is i think i mean genuinely i think literature scholars would kind of go huh because 23 is actually a separate thing it's a quotation of poetry or some song or something that was that people that was in the air right mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. this is this is poetic on some level it is a thing in and of itself and then we have the therefore in verse 24 which is the culmination of this whole thing, or at least since eight, verse 18. It's not good that the human is alone, therefore the human is gonna leave, right? Therefore mm. the human will leave his parents and go start his own thing. Mm-hmm. That's what. That's how I think literarily we respect scripture more is by for me, it was taking a step back and saying, okay, I've got all these things I want scripture to, <laughs> to support. So now let me just see what it's actually talking about. And so, mm. you know, we do the same thing with poetry in different parts of the scripture. We do the same thing with epic or we do the same thing, right? So this is a story about human companionship or human lifelong companionship, even desire for company f- for the journey, right? Mm. I don't think it's, I think we're actually disrespecting if we're trying to make too much about 23 to 24 in terms of a unit of thought. Hmm. So is it safe to say that in your estimation, kind of just putting it in layman's terms, that Genesis 2, while could definitely be hinting at some kind of companionship and lifelong companionship, that doesn't mean it's automatically talking about marriage, especially as how we understand it. Is that kind of what you're getting at ultimately? That is precisely what I'm trying to and get And even at. that verse 24, you know, a man, for this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they'll become one flesh. That really what that says is that they're having sex. It doesn't say, and they were married in the eyes of God. Is that kind of the, 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 the claim? Yeah. That, well, and it's not just the claim. It's that the Hebrew says, therefore man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his woman and the right. two become one flesh. Well, I mean, when I read that out loud, when I say that out loud in a classroom of undergrads, there's giggling and a lot of discomfort. Hmm. When I say, no, he's joined to his woman, not his wife. Some people will give me this, what the 
fuck, uh, you know, like that changes things. Uh, why am I told they're married? I was like, well, where is the ceremony? We literally just went in verse 23. We were man and woman, Ish and Isha. In verse 24, we're still Ish and Isha. There's nothing qualitatively different. We're just saying. Mm. Oh, that's important. So what you're saying is like, right. Okay. I'm sorry. This is clicking for the for the first time. Is, I'm trying, <laughs> at trying, all time. trying to it's jack hammer this. Live. <laughs> you're doing it. You're corrupting me, Jen, live on the air. But because the the wording for man and woman can either be translated by our people as husband and wife or man and woman to maybe denote certain things that might or might not be happening in the text – there's no language shift in the actual original language before right. and after okay. I've made the woman and the man, and now the woman and man will become one flesh by the woman taking or and you know leaving or it, taking his woman. There's right. no, it, there's, it's not like oh, okay. and now they were boyfriend and girlfriend, and now they're husband and wife. There's right, no, no, no such language is happening no. to show right. that difference. Is that correct? Right, right, right. Correct, and it's our own. Ooh. Interesting. Discomfort with the fact that they are becoming one flesh there at the end of that verse, right? That says, well, most people kind of get that that means they're having sex, you know, burn. So, yeah. Right, right. Of course they're married. I mean, that is literally what's going through the translation committee's heads. Right. They are telling us they're married, even though the story doesn't uphold that at all. There isn't a verb for it. They don't have different labels pre and post marriage. It's just he's going to leave his parents and cling to his woman and they're going to have some great sex. Right. And, and do you think it's, and I would like your thoughts on this because one of the things I reference often to people is like, listen, I know that it sounds convenient. This is a much more layman's argument. So just feel free to blow it away. I like it. It's I need the help. One. I'm, I'm I fine with that. Sure it's, but mm. oftentimes like what I tell people is like, listen, if you think Genesis one and or two, mainly two are <laughs> describing what marriage is designed to be since the beginning of the world, and then in Genesis four, Lamech takes two wives. Yeah, you know, it just it just seems like almost right away, like the and it doesn't say like it was necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it just seems like a lot of these ethics are kind of just jettisoned very quickly. If that was the standard, and that you would be seeing this consistent like, and what they did was wrong. You know, then you have David, where you know Nathaniel was prophesying on behalf of God to David, saying, "Didn't I give you enough wives, your previous king's wives, for crying?" You know, like I'm just making the point of like. I, I even find it on even a layman's terms, even if you assume that was marriage, right? Those ethics with the one man, one woman for life thing don't seem to stick along, uh, stick around super long. And if you do take Adam and Eve to be literal historical figures, the first people on the planet, the first generation is jettisoning their own uh, or, or is jettisoning God's ordained sexual ethic. Like how God set it up is set up for disaster because the kids are all – it's getting real weird real quick. We'll just keep it there, right? So yep. any thoughts? Like, I mean, are these like are these like fair points to make? Are they kind of disingenuous? Because I make these points a lot, but I don't want to argue from a place of bad faith if it's not a good take. No, I think it's the I think it's the best. When I see you make that argument, I'm like, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Lamech in verse four in chapter four is taking more than one woman. I just, I'm going to keep saying that on this Please thing. Do. It, Please do. It's not wife. It's woman. They're taking, he is, he's marrying more than one woman. Um, Solomon has multiple women and multiple concubines. Well, let's talk about that. Concubines right. are women who are there specifically for sex. Right. Right. We have the Levites, the Levite and his concubine in Judges 19. We have, we can't get the people of Israel without Jacob marrying taking two sister wives simultaneously right. and the enslaved women that belong to them the, right. we it is required po polygamy is required to make the tribes of israel nobody's denying that nobody's judging it we're just trying to sweep it under the carpet because it's a little inconvenient right but jacob having s access to four women's bodies for the sake of sex and procreating happens at the end of one week. He says to Laban, my time of serving you has come to an end. Give me my woman so I can go into her. They have a dinner party. Laban puts the wrong daughter in. Jacob has sex with her anyway. Don't tell me he didn't know. In the morning, right? right, right he's been right. working with these two for seven years. Uh, <laughs> right, in the right? right? Um, in the morning, oh, hey, I right. just marked the wrong territory. What's no. going on here? Right. Um, 
Right. Okay, just give her the week with you alone. And then at the end of the week, we'll give you Rachel too. And there, and the, so within a week, he's has access to four women's bodies. Mm. No questions about, you know, back to your other question, Rachel and Leah's interest in this. And there's no judgment of Jacob that he's um, raping. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> If we get taken down for that, it's your fault, okay? I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's no judgment of him for the way he is forcing himself upon them. Right. And over and yeah. over. And it's just, we just pretend it's not there because we're focused on the outcome, right? We're focused yeah. on the fact that there are, there are tribes, there are, these are the heads of the tribes. So, okay. so what I think is important is to not try to defend what we would like, but to be honest about what is. Right. I, I think that's fair. Because again, we, we want to take the Bible seriously. I still hold it as authoritative in my life. I see it as inspired in its own unique way. I don't I don't hold it to inerrancy, but you know, I, I see it as like a handshake between God and humans. You know, it's messy, okay. it's complicated, but like something something special is going on. That's how I would see it, right? And I'm still I'm still navigating what that even means, but I'm still in that camp. Um and because of that, I want to know what do the texts that we have today actually say when they're situated in their proper context. And mm -hmm. from there, what do we do with them? How do we negotiate with them? What do we think is wise for today versus not wise for today? You know, and there's, mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of ingredients that go into that. So I think that's very important. I think it's also key that we address maybe the elephant in the room for some people, which we're going to get into with this next clip, where what about Jesus, right? Because doesn't Jesus mm -hmm. seem to reaffirm uh, mm -hmm. at least this, this creation account in one of the conversations? So are you cool if I mm -hmm. move on to Preston's other point or do you have something else you want to add here go ahead okay this might not, i think that, no this the thing i want to right say away. i think comes you know i think it comes up from addressing okay. this particular quote. but yep. my screen could be messed up again so let's see if this works or not <laughs> it didn't work hold on okay, 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 okay. <laughs> i will find the file uh, i have it right here while you're doing that i'm like yeah the the comment about one flesh i think is also important because in the story, it's very important, right? That they are, the two people are becoming one. Yes. I also have a chart. We don't need to pull this chart up, but I do have a chart in the chapter um, about how various translations have handled that basar echad in the Hebrew, mm. one, um, one flesh. Um, and they don't all, most of them say one flesh, but there are a couple other options in terms of become one person, blah, blah, blah. So is this emotional? Is this spiritual? Is this blah, blah, blah. Right. Is it just the, are we talking about a two backed beast? You know, like, what are mm. we, is it the literal, you know, having sex or is it the, the big relationship thing here? You know, mm. people aren't agreed on how to handle that, but yes, Fair. this is, this is important to me to note because in the Hebrew, so the old Testament Hebrew Bible, one flesh only shows up once, and that's here in Genesis 2, 24. If you were to put one flesh into BibleGateway.com and search for it, it will come up two other times, and that is Matthew 19 and Ephesians 5, 31. And that's like those, you know, Genesis 1, 28, Genesis 2, 24, Matthew 19, 4 to 6, and Ephesians 5, 31. Those are the four biblical marriage passages. So two of them are quoting Genesis 2, 24, so I want to suggest that instead of saying this is how the Bible talks about marriage, I'd like to suggest that we think about that a little differently as well, that it's, this is a biblical passage. Yes. That as when we get to Matthew 19, that, that the scribes and the Jew, Jewish people are going to use to talk about something, mm. but, but, but keep, hold, keep in mind everything we've just discussed about Genesis two and right. what it's up to and what it's telling us. And right. so, and then go from there. Okay. All right, here we go. Hopefully this works. And right before he quotes, I did Genesis it. This is 224 though. He actually leads with quoting Genesis 127, where it says, have you not read from the beginning? God created them male and female. And then he quotes 224 for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother be joined his wife and the two shall become one flesh. I mean, linguistically, and I would say theologically, the two that become one flesh, I mean, clearly linguistically, just if you could just do grammar, the two are the male and female, that Jesus kind of went out of his way, reaches back to Genesis Agreed. 1, brings in this text where sex difference is not just there, it's kind of like the main point of Genesis 1, 27. So when Jesus quotes Genesis 2, 24, when he talks about this one flesh union, it's seems clear to me and most Christians throughout history, you know, that sex difference is part of what that one flesh union is. 
Okay, so to summarize, the claim is that, look, Jesus reiterates parts of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Sex difference is a key part of what he's reiterating, um, and he's talking about marriage, uh, obviously. And so, therefore, this is Jesus reaffirming that the created order is designed for one man, one woman, a.k.a. sex difference, engaging in a marital covenant, uh, covenant for life. I think that's kind of like, I mean, the for life part, Preston didn't say, but that's always mm-hmm. kind of in this context of when I hear it in these kinds of spaces, that's always kind of part of that conversation. So Implied. I'm not saying mm-hmm. Preston would even agree with me there, but I'm saying in the broader context, I hear that pretty often. Yeah, exactly. And the same with covenant language, which I yes. want to push back on again, because it's not, it's not, they're, they aren't making vows. They're not promising to each other till death do us part. That isn't that isn't at all because she's literally been purchased for him. He, she's his property, right? That's what happens biblically speaking when it talk, comes to taking. But I want to address specifically because I I definitely thought about this passage the way that I we just heard Preston talk about it until I started doing research <laughs> on uh you, you know like some of the some of the some of the articles I discovered as I was looking into this. So one of the things to me is that's important to note is here, Jesus, okay. In verse three, it's, it's, it gives us the context of the setting, right? So when, yeah, thank you. Then some Pharisees who were teachers of the law, right? They know the scriptures well, came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? What they're actually asking is, which reason are you okay with a man divorcing? That's the argument. That's the conversation that's taking place. And what Jesus does and what, what we see taking place in verses four through nine is basically a conversation that's already taken place dozens of times. Jesus isn't saying anything new except maybe verse nine. Everything else up to verse nine, right? So verse four through eight, Jesus is participating in the conversation that they know because they've had it for, I mean, this was already in writing 200 BCE. It was this conversation about that the Jewish rabbis would have about what we call marriage and whether whether or not people are allowed to divorce. They were having this exchange. They were saying, well, but look at Genesis 127 says this, and then there's that thing in Genesis 224, and then all the yada yada, but then we have this thing in Deuteronomy 24 that allows a man to divorce. So what's the story? For which reason is it allowed? So this whole premise is about, hey, Jesus, do you agree with Shammai, which is one of the Jewish rabbis? Or do you agree with Hillel, another Jewish rabbi? Which reason are you okay with? It Can it be for just any reason? Or do you have to have a really good reason? And so what we have is a back and forth. He says what they expect him to respond to, quoting Genesis 127, 224, and then you get, well, yeah, but then in verse 7, why did Moses have a decree to allow us to divorce? And Jesus is like, yeah, it's because a bunch of dudes in our ancestry were really hard hearted, but like, come on, don't, don't throw this stuff away so easily. And then what I do think is really important Hmm. to this whole conversation is verse nine through 12, because verses nine through 12 show us what Jesus was thinking or what the author of Matthew think, you know, heard that Jesus said, or however you want to handle that. I don't want to get into those details. Right. (laughs) Right. Good call. But this is what's new. Right. And, and I think Preston and Sean even talked about this when they said, you know, um, they didn't say it like this. I'm going to kind of rephrase what they were saying, which is in Matthew. And this, this pertains to what I think the, the Mathian writer was about. Jesus is shown multiple times and places in the Gospel of Matthew, taking Jewish law and making it more strict. He's, I kind of refer to it as ratcheting it up, and I don't mean to be disrespectful when I say that. Jesus takes the Jewish law and he just makes it an even higher bar for righteousness. And that's a very Jewish thing to do. So when he does here in verse nine, now I tell you, so this is what we're getting that's from Jesus, all right? Yeah, right. Now I tell you, whoever divorces his woman, except for sexual morality, and marries another, so there is a verb for Mary in the Greek, commits adultery. I want to talk about that separately from what happens in 10 through 12. 
what he's saying is really important to me and what's mm. but it's also really one of the hardest things to talk about with a christian because what this is telling us is that jesus also along with his scriptures thinks about sex as a way that a man marks his territory jesus also reflects that a man having sex with a woman means that she now belongs to him she is now his property because that's what adultery is adultery is not cheating on a sacred bond as much as most of us think of it that way right you've made a commitment and you don't step out on that you just don't and we all right. support you in not stepping out on that right right that's a sacred bond it's an important thing you entered into you didn't take it lightly i don't take it lightly as your community right hmm. that is not what adultery was about biblically speaking and jesus reflects his scriptures here when he talks about it as property or as adultery is about when a man has sex with someone else's property someone else's woman okay hold on i i, I need to process this um so whoa okay jen slow maybe i got the wrong pro friends i'm so sorry I, I didn't know this is gonna go this way i'm just kidding. um um i want to rephrase what i heard you say <laughs> I'm trying to practice active listening because you're Screw right. You what, what, when I see this, right, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality marries another woman and commits adultery. I see that that it's the man who had sex who's at fault here, right? Like, oh, someone couldn't stay committed to their wife. They weren't, they were, they just, they looked at someone else's wife and just had to have sex with them. So it's the man's fault. And that's the problem. But I hear what you're saying is no, the problem is that that man slept with someone putting it lightly who was already owned by someone else is that what you're saying no actually what i'm saying is Sorry, the reason I'm no it's good I'm, i appreciate your comment and i appreciate that we're doing this live what what is the problem here is that when you divorce yes you and your spouse are both going to want to go get married again have a have a relationship right remarry and that will be adultery against this first marriage. The oh, so the is, woman's already been marked. The, the woman's already been marked. Here's the thing. I don't know if he means that this guy's woman was sexually immoral or that he was sexually immoral. And I don't think that matters. What matters is Jesus is saying, if you divorce and remarry, you're committing adultery against your first marriage. Jesus is still talking about marriage through the lens of sex. That sex is what defines a marriage. And you know what? For the most part, that is absolutely true. And that is part of the problem here. It is why it is so hard to talk about because people are so well trained to see that sex only happens in marriage. But that's not actually true, biblically speaking. And it's not true, but it's what we've been taught and it's what we're comfortable with. And we tried to respect that, but it's not actually healthy for us to think about that. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, can we try this again? I'm going to swim yes. to that. And, Let's do uh, that. Uh, you know, audience, if you're watching and, and, and you get it, please put it in the comments so I can understand. I am. So the way I usually read this verse or I've been taught yeah. to read it, right, is okay. Yeah. Uh, if me and my partner, my wife are yeah. in a relationship yeah. And yeah. someone sleeps with someone else. Okay. So let's just say it's me. I say, oh, you know what? I had an affair with Jane mm -hmm. Doe down the street. Mm -hmm. We had mm -hmm. sex. Mm -hmm. My wife is allowed to divorce me. Okay. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if my wife and I are married, and let's just say I'm not really a great husband, I'm just kind of a jerk, I'm kind of apathetic, whatever, and she leaves me. She's now committing adultery against me because she didn't have the right to divorce me because it wasn't in sec for sexual immorality. Does that make sense? That's how I was oh, yeah. taught to read that. Yeah. Now, I am see I, that. And I, okay. I see so, that as, as a legitimate way to interpret that verse. Okay. And you are saying what? The issue on the table is sex. Yeah. And that sex is the thing that makes you married. 
Not and a ceremony, I'm, not a covenant. I'm, exactly. Sex. I'm suggesting that Jesus is well, t- well trained by his scriptures. He is reflecting what his scriptures teach him, which is it's all about sex. And it's about sex is what makes you mine. And so if one of us has broken that, then it's just broken. It doesn't matter. But if, if neither one of us have broken that, and you both, and one of you goes and has sex with someone else, you get remarried, you are committing adultery on this first union, which is, which is saying, which is the reason this is so hard for me is in the Hebrew Bible, men have sex with women. It is not a mutual thing. It is not a thing that people are both, in fact, we, I'm sorry, there are all these tangents on this one, but it's, they're all inter, they are all interrelated. Sure. It's, you know, men, culturally speaking, men are the active partner and women are literally talked about and believed to be passive receptacles or receivers. Right. Men do a thing to women or in the case of uh, other humans, it's like, you know, lesser, lesser power people that, but they are doing the thing to the other. Right. right. What this verse is doing and it's more like I just need you to maybe just sit with it and come back to it in a few days. Yeah. Is is highlighting that the thing that matters most is sex. It isn't. Maybe it's easier to come at it this way. It isn't about the fact that you two have this bond, you've created a family together, you have friends together, you've shared resources, you have history together, you've traveled, you have shared joys and sorrows and you've supported each other through these things and it'll be really painful and difficult to pull apart. That is not the issue at all. Mm. The issue is about sex and sex marks your territory. Okay. Yeah. Someone's here. I'm gonna put this comment up here. Uh, Dr. Matt said, so it's about a sexual, (laughs) uh, so it's about a sexual contract where sex outside the partnership is a breach of contract. Is that a better way of putting it? Yeah. And it's all about the sexual contract. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. I almost banned Dr. Matt. Sorry about that. I did not mean to do that. <laughs> okay. I'm that's, honored that's, that he's here. That is helpful, but also I do see the similarities because in in my tradition, like, you know, the main reason why you get married, besides being close friends, is sex, right? Because you're just oh, kind of totally. holding it in and can't wait to have sex. So, like, sex is what people often taught me is the differentiator between me and my best friend and then me and my partner, right? It's like we're having sex and through that – intimacy that holy moment we are spiritually bonded in a unique way that then intertwines our life what i hear you saying is like "Mm, it's more about just the physical act of like who's penetrating who and like there you go you're married now technically and that's what it's really about not so much like all the emotional or like the life stuff or the facebook memories that you're going to post or think about the kids it's not so much about that for this it's about you had sex with someone else you shouldn't have done that so bad person the end you've broken that sexual contract i thank you matt for the dr monger for that yeah you've broken that contract it's been broken so now it doesn't matter uh go be free and to do whatever but the thing is i like i really want people to sit with what this is saying about bodies and about sex do you do you know what i'm saying like Okay, can I put it this way? Is it kind of like despiritualizing and de, um, like desacralizing sex to being like a a I I hate to sound this, but like just a bodily function between two people. Yes. Well, it is, and that's I'm how it's talked about. Oh. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh boy. I, oh, I mean that just it, it's how people talk about porn, right? Like oh, porn is just like so degrading because it just makes it about two people having random, you know, no emotionally attached sex on camera whatever it is i feel like we have like that kind of like what, and again i don't want to misinterpret but like no. what you're kind of saying is like and i, I don't want to downplay it, but it's just sex like it's the sex is what we're talking about here and it's like nothing else yeah. it's the yeah. sex yeah it is it really is and all of any any christian in particular who has this thing about sex being sacred and holy and marriage being sacred and holy you have inherited that belief. You come by that belief, honestly, but it's not supported by scripture for sure. Well, okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll, do you want to go back to the, to this eunuch section or just leave that alone for now and kind of move on? The, the, the eunuch part I've heard you talk about, I know it's a whole different rabbit hole that is, 
but it's really important. Okay, so let's get here, and then I'm gonna make a note to come back to your comment very about brief. sex is not sacred. All right, go ahead. Okay. The floor is yours. Just very. I'll do this briefly, but I think it, it as you said, because but I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, because this is the thing that Jesus is introducing. So if you think about Matthew 19, 3 to 12 as a segment all together, right? I'm not going to judge people that want to cherry pick verses 4, 5, and 6 out of this. People, everybody cherry picks. But it is interesting that people want to focus on 4, 5, and 6. The reason that's interesting to me is because that isn't Jesus's idea. Hmm. What Jesus is saying in this in this encounter is what comes now, right? This thing about reaff reaffirming that uh, marriage for us is about, in this case, we call it marriage, but marriage is about a man claiming a woman. Women are property, and he claims that property by having sex with it, right? And Jesus is reaffirming that. And then his disciples are like, oh my gosh, if that's the case, then it's better for us not to marry. And Jesus is like, yeah, it might be because here's the story. Like he doesn't talk them out of their claim that it's better not to marry. He actually agrees with them. And then he goes on to say, here's a word that not everybody can handle, but those who can handle it should and he talks about castration. He talks about people born with, you know, males born without testes. He talks about some who were, have it removed. And in some cases, it's actually also the penis. And then some people who make themselves castrated for the sake of the kingdom. And by the way, this isn't just metaphorical. This was happening. People were doing that. And it is tangential to other Greco-Roman practices. But it was such an important issue in the early church that at the very first um, ecumenical council in 325, from which most people know uh, we get the Nicene Creed, that's yeah. just one of many things they talked about. The very first thing they came out of the gate to denounce was castrating yourself for the sake of the kingdom. If you've castrated yourself, you don't, you can't be a leader in the church. That was people taking this literally, not metaphorically. The other two things I want to say briefly is the Christian tradition starting in the fourth century started reading eunuchs as meaning celibate. But eunuchs in the first century were not celibate. They were, in fact, had a reputation, whether or not it applied to all, had a reputation for being very sexually active with mm. both male and female partners because, well, they were safe, you know, in mm. terms of pregnancy. And they were they were under the radar and, and disliked, and we could get into all of that. I don't want to. My point is, just for the sake of this conversation about marriage, someone asked Jesus which reason for divorce he approves of, and he ends up talking about human body, humans who embody a non-binary position in life, a non-binary gender, whose reputation is that they are quite sexually active. It has nothing to do with celibacy, and it's impossible to procreate as such a human, yeah. right? So we're challenging Genesis 128 here in this need to procreate, which I know Preston and Sean did not talk about, but my point is for people who think of it that way, Jesus is saying everyone who can handle it should do this. Now, there's a there's a whole other conversation in terms of why would he say that? But the point is, scripturally speaking, Jesus is affirming, uh, what is that saying about marriage? It's saying it doesn't need to be procreative. It's saying what? I don't know, but in terms of marriage, but he's, because he's not talking about marriage. He's talking about people making themselves eunuchs for the kingdom. It's really important to me that people take this seriously instead of getting uncomfortable and running away from it, which is what happened the last time I tried to talk about this with a conservative friend. He was like, <laughs> uh, uh, and he just yeah. ran to a different conversation. I'm like, no, this is what Jesus says. You want to know what Jesus says about marriage? This is what he says. Women are property. Sex marks your territory. And by the way, if you can handle it, chop off your balls. Mm. I can't handle that. I, I'm, um, you know, maybe because you've already had enough that it gets call okay. Me, like, call me like not committed, but I'm just, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I, I read right? Jesus. I, I can't go to the ends of the earth, I guess, after all, because, um, 
just that's just not gonna happen okay <laughs> right. um so okay so i know we're running at the hour and a half mark i can't believe it i i want to i want to keep going as far as we can yeah, there's yeah. A, okay. a lot okay. of topics here and side notes that i i was hoping we can get I to know. i don't know if, if we're gonna have okay. time to get to okay um, okay one thing let's let's get to this <clears throat> clip and and see what your thoughts are i think this will kind of tie into um my other point i wanted to make earlier so here we go okay good yeah, mm. if you follow God faithfully, He will bless you with a spouse. Mm -hmm. Kind of this, you know, and sometimes it's, you know, I don't, that's a whole nother conversation to, that you would be sure. probably more well equipped to engage in. But yeah, it does kind of seem to idolize sex and marriage beyond what I think the Bible does. Why? I mean, the Bible, I think, you know, marriage is a sacred, essential institution. But yep. I think the Bible also would say it's not, you don't need to be married to the person you desire to have a happy, flourishing life. So. Okay, so there's two things in this conversation. One I feel pretty passionate about. The other one I want to get to, which is that sacredness piece, because I I, I think about like Ephesians when Paul's talking about marriage as a reflection of you know uh, Christ and His church, and I'm like, well, I know Jen that you said that in the biblical world, sex is or marriage is not sacred, but then I'm like, well, Paul's making a pretty spiritual metaphor that certainly to me, through mm -hmm. my eyes, thinks mm -hmm. makes it seem like it's pretty at mm -hmm. least holy or there's something special happening between just a normal friendship. So put a pin mm -hmm. in that. But one thing that, mm -hmm. that, that, that mm -hmm. Preston says that I found interesting that I would probably push back pretty hard on is he mentions in an earlier clip, actually I have it here. Let me just play it. And then I'll, we'll mm -hmm. get into the, my point well, yeah. that yeah. sex and marriage is necessary mm. for human flourishing. So this is the context of how queer people don't have to get married because mm -hmm. is sex ne is marriage necessary for human flourishing? Right. After they right. talked about Genesis one and two and the creation account and how sacred you know marriage is for queer people, we can you know it's not that important after all. And this is one of the points I make early on in the book that before we even get into this, I think we need to assume what I think is really clear in Scripture that there is no promise from God that. Um, that we must have a spouse to live a happy, flourishing mm. life as a believer. I mean, the singleness. Okay, I'm going to just stop him here and just point out a couple of things. Number one, I I, I don't necessarily disagree with Preston on like the idea that you don't have to be married yeah. a, 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 yeah. a full life. My pushback, and maybe it's not fair for me to lump Sean and Preston in this world because they are right. kind of in their own way, their own mavericks. But they, the, mm -hmm. the evangelical culture I grew up in right. like couldn't reinforce enough how exactly. important marriage was. It, it mm -hmm. fulfills the commitment to be fruitful and multiply. It, my soulmate is out there. It is, you know, run as fast as you can towards God. And when you're, when you look over and see that woman running just as hard, that's the one. I mean, like that was, I, I read wild at heart at 18 with like, I need to find a beauty to rescue. You know, like that's just how those were the mm -hmm. waters that I grew up in. Right. And mm -hmm. Hey, if you save yourself right. for marriage, sex will be unbelievable you know like just <laughs> save and wait and you're guaranteed a good sex life now fortunately for me my wife and i never really had problems in our sex life we always had really good communication awesome. and we awesome. kind of we we were very right. happy right but for, yeah. for every one of me there are 50 or 100 more especially a right. lot of women uh who talk to me and say yeah that was not my experience um things were not functioning properly i was really tense it was like a, i couldn't turn right. the light switch off of thinking about exactly. it being dirty and like gross and then just all of a sudden hot and erotic right and right. so i do find it like difficult that that like and preston and sean say this later on in the, in the interview which we, i don't have time to get into they say that like this is perhaps not a secondary issue this is a pretty primary issue like how we think about marriage and how we think about the sacredness and the sanctity and the beautifulness and like you know all the stuff but then they kind of pivot and are like well you don't have to be married to live a fulfilling life so if you're gay or queer just be celibate like just that's all you got to do and i just don't think it's like a, a fair take based on the culture that they come from and that in my opinion and I would tell them this to their face if they're watching. Mm -hmm. I don't think they talk about it enough. I don't think they really unpack the danger of purity culture. I don't think that I don't think that that they, that they unpack how much harm this idea of your special someone is out there. And from the beginning of time, God has ordained marriage. It's in the creation account, and we want to get back to creation. That has all kinds of implications, right? What if you are a single, what if you're asexual? What if you just want to be left alone? Are you broken? Are you not as welcome in the family of God? Now, of course, Preston and Sean would say, no, of course you are. But the the systems and the cultures that I participated in, that they participated in, they speak louder than the words of, of course you're welcome. They show that, no, 
the ideal for our church, for our culture is one man, one woman married for life with their three kids and a picket fence. So I just want to respond to that part personally that I just don't think it's Mm -hmm. like a fair statement to make overall. Again, I want to be clear. I'm not saying Sean and Preston would even agree with what I said as far as like the purity culture stuff, but I don't think that they're nearly as loud enough about this, about that as they are about this kind of stuff that I think ultimately is not as important to like draw a hard line around personally. So anyway, that's out of the way. That's my rant. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, no, because I think what you've said is important needs to stand on its own. But I do want to tag on to that. The other clip about one of them saying that they just don't buy that it is harmful. Oh, yeah, we can get to that clip and then we'll maybe we can, can even we just, end with that. But that's can we what get, I was thinking. Can Go we ahead. get to the sacred part really quick? Like, can oh, you sure. help me understand? <laughs> Again, I think about Ephesians. I'll pull up the verses so we have them. But like, sure. and maybe one argument I can make and then you can respond is to be fair, we are talking about a lot of time passing between Paul and like Genesis and, you know, the Hebrew mm-hmm. Bible. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. things could have changed perhaps. I don't know. But I, I do think there's at least maybe a case to make that look. It looks it looks at least sacred to me now from Paul's perspective. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. I'm going to talk faster than I probably should because I want to say several things. Go ahead. One, we do – we because you and I didn't fully get into this and, again – but I, I just want to say it while we're here on this stream, right? In the Hebrew Bible, we have a lot of marriages being talked about. And we even have, as they reference briefly near the end of their conversation, you know, God is married to Israel. Like it is a sacred thing to talk yes. about. There's a really interesting article that I stumbled across. And so I can't get into all of that. But a lot of people believe that that's a, like an ancient Near Eastern thing is to talk about gods and the people married. And actually... It's a relatively new development, and it's when it is used in the Hebrew Bible, prophets, it's used in the prophets a lot that God or Yahweh, forgive me for naming the name, but just, you know, that the God is the husband to Israel, the wife. It is only brought up, this kind of a relationship, a married or sexual relationship between the God and the people is only brought up in a way to shame them back into relationship with God. It is... It, it, you know, it might be said, you know, God really wants you to return to him and to be back in a relationship with him and all that stuff. But that comes after this stereotypical abusive relationship outlined, hmm. right? That God has just said, I'm going to uh, expose your parts <laughs> and I'm going to go at them in front of other people. Hmm. And I might kill you with thirst and I'm going to do all these things because I want you to come back to me so badly. Hmm. Like this is abusive like this is abuse 101 that's in Hosea and that you know there's a lot for me to say about marriage in the bible is not sacred it is it is talked about in the hebrew bible as men do a thing and they get to own women and they get to do to women whatever they want and we could talk about the laws around engagement inter intimate engagements we could talk about those but that's not i don't want to get into that now yeah, but my no, totally my fair. point is it isn't being talked about in a sacred way. The women do not get to have a consent. They do not even usually have a voice. We're not talking about equals. You can't show me a place where marriage looks like something sacred in the Hebrew Bible, because I don't think there is one. We do have in Song of Songs, we do have Mm. a couple different couples talking about their lovers whom they have known intimately. They are not married. and and it's talking about the, the the enjoyment they've had. Well, I I actually also have an issue with this because it's a very lustful physical thing, which is fine. I'm fine with that. But it doesn't get into baby, your mind makes me hot, which a lot of people actually <laughs> do connect with. You know right, what I'm saying? Like right, yeah, it's yeah, still yeah. very lustful and, and a little more about, about about physical body parts. You know? Yeah. 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 So yeah. okay. So like, show me a place where where marriage is sacred in the Hebrew Bible because I don't believe it exists. Now, mm. talking about it in the Newer Testament, where yes. is marriage sa- sacred there aside from Ephesians five? I show me that because I don't know that there is that either. And we do get. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 talking about the one place where Paul's letters talk about men and women as equals, right? Is that um, if, you know, the question posed to him is, it might be better for men not to touch women, meaning it might be better for me not to have 
sex with my my woman right and that's the that's the problem that's been posed and paul and his buddies are supposed to respond to that and so he's like well yeah but if you can't keep it in your pants like if you can't keep all the passions under control then do go get married because that will give you an outlet for your passions not give you a place to indulge them and enjoy them which is how mm. i read that in college right yeah, i too. had friends yeah i had friends who didn't kiss until their wedding day i had friends that you know what i mean like all the things because that we all misunderstood that Paul mm. is actually down on passions, period. Mm. Mm. And so this is how you put it out is by getting married. Is that sacred? I don't know that that's sacred. He's actually as and again, Sean and Preston referred to this, that Paul is actually pretty, pretty down with singleness and celibacy. Right. Uh, a question to raise about the book of Philemon, but again, another day, yeah. but but still out there. Um, sacred okay really all you've got is this thing in ephesians and what's important to me is not just that verse is this what you're talking about this part yes it is yeah. thank you you're a very good wingman okay aye, aye. um yeah, yeah, yeah um verse 31 and 32 are the two verses that are pulled out to help define biblical marriage not 33 not 33 oh, sorry 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 no it's important because for this reason, a man will leave a father. Oh, we've already heard about that. That's Genesis 2.24 and become to become more. Oh, yep. And so here we go. The mystery is profound, but I'm speaking about Christ in the church. I actually, this is chapter four of my book is looking at this and then also looking at Augustine and his take on sex and marriage, because it's, it's, you can't talk about it well without talking about what, thank you, what the How church inherited. From, there you go. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Pre-order now, oh, wait, friends. Kinda... Wait, wrong way. Mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> both, both the website or the uh, or Amazon, you can pre-order. But um, right, we do. We have this language in Ephesians five, thirty-two. This mystery is profound. So, and and I'm I am not denying this. Okay, I'm not denying yeah. that there's a mystery here we're talking about, and that the writer of this letter is talking about Christ in the church. What is important to me is to take it all in cons all in perspective, which means I read verses 21 to 33 as a section, not just 31 and 32. Mm. And if you take that whole section, look at what's being said. And by the way, oh, 21 to 33, not just oh, sorry, 31. No, it's okay. Um, having issues with my loom cube so we're gonna have to do that and see if that uh, works you're, okay you're right okay um you're like yeah we don't need to see your face we've seen it this whole time we're good um <laughs> now that now that's that's imposing thoughts onto the text if you, it if you is i am i'm misreading you and your intentions yeah yep, yeah yep, never said it not there you Sorry, did it <laughs> you did it um again this is this could take all day but i don't i just want to focus on yeah you know, give like, me a couple I, highlights I really here. want to but th the thing is we've got 21 where it says submit to each other out of it's not fear it's actually fear it's not reverence it's fear for christ mm. by the way the in, the greek there is pretty disturbing when you just kind of can look at it so 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 be subject to each other out of fear of christ but then the very next verse resubordinates women to men women not wives women submit mm. to your men as to the lord for the man is the head of the woman as christ is the head of the church his body of which he is a savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, submits to Christ, so women should submit to their men in everything. Okay, that's really hard for me to consider as anything that I would want to be a part of. Hmm. I also think that the next couple of verses are not fair to men because it's setting a standard saying you should be willing to lay down your life for your woman, you know, just the way Christ died for the church. But, you know, Christ, according to the According to theology, Christ was brought back from the dead and you don't get to be brought back from the dead. Mm. You're dead. Like that's it. Like it's an unfair standard. It puts really unfair pressure on men. And but these ideals are still alive and well for us today that the woman needs to be taken care of and the man is that person and blah, blah, blah. So we have this section is talking about this. It's reinstating. It's reinstating women being subordinate to men which we got away from because of Paul's early ideas, like in Galatians 3 or what we saw in 1 Corinthians 7, that mm. men and women are actually equals in Christ. But now we have, no, no, not just 
uh, not, I mean, in the church, women are subordinate to men as they, as the church is to Christ. And so when, if you just look at 31 and 32, you're missing the kind of the foundation or the worldview that this mystery comes out of. Mm. And it is, it is sacralizing women being subordinate to men. It is sacralizing that along with saying that the marriage relationship imitates or reflects Christ and his bride. Mm -hmm. So we have unconsciously hetero marriage is being stamped sacred. And by the way, being married is being is saying this reflects your relationship to Christ. So too bad, single people. Um, all the things. And then the other piece to this, which is interesting and a sidebar, but also related, is the language of mystery. Everywhere else in the letter of Ephesians, the word mystery is used to talk about the gospel or uh, you know something about God's covenant and people being brought into the covenant with God. Only here is it, it's here in Ephesians 5.32 is this, it's the one usage of mystery in this way in the entire New Testament. Hmm. Okay. It's it's different and sure, it's, it's we could call it inspired if you want, it's poetic. It isn't actually a mystery though, 2000 years later. Christians assume it, believe it, assert it, live into it, believe that Christian marriage is more sacred and beautiful than other marriages, all of this stuff. I mean, the popes have come out and said that that is the case. A Christian marriage is more sacred and beautiful than other marriages because it's Christ in the church. I mean, right. if you believe that, you've been paying attention. It's right. That's what you've. That, that's what your scriptures are asserting. So, yeah. I'm not in denial of the fact that the script that Ephesians five has this this mystery, and that's where we end up getting sacrament, sacramentum in the Latin in the right. early fifth century. And that's where we get another 500 years later. This is a sacrament that yeah. takes over a thousand years. In the Bible itself, if, if marriage is sacred, marriage according to the Bible is a, is a dynamic that men get to rule in. Hmm. And women are subject to the men in, and women are the property of the men in. Okay. You can uh, have that as sacred if you want, but I want nothing to do with that. Yeah, uh, that is totally fair. So, okay, let's start landing this plane. Where I was at the two hour mark. Okay. Um, okay. You know, Jen, again, I appreciate you making time. Um, here's what I want to sum up. I want to sum up really just kind of the thesis that you presented that I find compelling, right? And essentially, okay. what, okay. what I hear you saying is that, listen, well, yes, um, obviously in the biblical text, sex difference is a sign of some kind of sexual relationship that people have called marriage in some way, shape, or form. That is not the only, nor is it the primary criteria by which this concept of marriage is is talked about because the idea of marriage that we have is completely foreign in almost yes. every single text that yes. we understand that's right. in the text, especially in the Hebrew Bible. And then it gets only murkier with eunuchs and celibacy versus right. you know, letting that's your right. passion out. And so the that's point right. is not to say, look, guys, here is a compelling case for why the Bible affirms, even in this conversation, queer marriage. Right. We're yeah. just saying yeah. if you're going to make the claim that sex difference is, is the standard, therefore you're going to draw a boundary around it, why aren't you drawing boundaries around – consent or non-consent or ownership or, you know, right. or other right. things that we see that are part of the marriage, again, marriage term used loosely, ingredient yes. list. And are you right. doing that because your own standard or modern ethic is overriding what obviously would be problematic, right? So for example, obviously consent in, I, I would hope anyone watching this would agree, yes, we no man should force a woman to you know, have sex with him. We have a word for that that we're not going to say because of the algorithms, but you get my point, right? But in the Bible, that's not really a major prohibition of like, whoa, whoa, if she doesn't consent, guys, you obviously can't do that. That's not talked about. So why, uh, if the standard is what does the Bible say and we follow what the Bible says, you're going to end up in some pretty shaky weird territory pretty quickly if you just right. take it completely literally on its face for what we see a sexual relationship looks like in the scriptures. Am I kind of getting your thesis yeah. somewhere? Yep. 
Yeah, you really are. And the other piece of this, the flip side, which again, we can't get into, but just to reference briefly, is that men in in the, in the stories and the narratives, the sacred narratives and scriptures, right? Men who are married are have are stepping out and it's okay. In fact, Abraham does it. And there's a, there's an element of force there with Hagar. Jacob does it. There's an element of force. Um, there's right. We have all these men who are stepping out, and it's actually important to the to the where things are going to he- where things are headed. Nobody's judging it. It's a part of their practices. It's a part of the way they did things. Right. To me, we're actually not respecting scripture if we pretend that's not there. Yeah. We right. Um, and. You know, I, I I find it actually really important to sit with the way God is depicted, which is, by the way, not necessarily who God is, but the way God is depicted in mm-hmm. the scriptures relating to people, relating to the people as, in this language, as his bride. God calls his bride... Um, a sex a sex worker but the net like the word like a, a slur whore. Word. oh yeah 13 times in ezekiel 16 like right do you call your wife a whore tim no i mean you'd be out on the you know on the curb Very right i mean i'd be in a lot of trouble with a lot of people like that's not even appropriate like but right. god is doing it and it's not just ezekiel here it's not just this it's multiple times over and over and over again we didn't even talk about really like there's so many things we didn't talk sure. about but my sure. yeah Yes, let's be honest about all of the components that yes. are that are in these sacred scriptures about marriage. Right. And you know, to say that sex difference is a defining element of marriages, to me, that is prefacing the thing that is important in their understanding of things instead of looking at all of the things that are going on. I'm not in denial that only people talked about as married in the Bible are male, female. That is not up for debate. Yeah. So for me, saying that sex difference is a defining element is an interesting observation. But so are all these other pieces, as you said, Tim, in your very nice summary. I just want to, you know, like. I need to add here that depending on the Christian tradition you're a part of, they'll emphasize different things about marriage, right? Like a uh, more Doug Wilson type is to emphasize the submission part, right? That, that hey, the Bible's clear. Women are to submit to their husbands, That's right? right? That's so right. we That's can right. even look, you know, people maybe even watching this have experienced that, this, this bludgeoning over the head of, look, the Bible's clear. So women submit to your husband. So, so any, not anyone, but people obviously highlight different parts of what they think the Bible is emphasizing about quote unquote marriage. And mm-hmm. the re- and, and that could be, as we know, very problematic for a lot of reasons. But I think two things I want to end with this, and, and I, I we're just so over time. One of the questions that, that Preston and Sean bring up is, is this, does this bring harm to the LGBTQ community? Yeah. And ultimately my short answer is yes, but for a lot of other reasons, maybe than even they would see. I just want to, I want to kind of close with this kind of maybe last few thoughts. I can I can hear some people saying a couple of objections. Well, Tim, there's a difference between prescriptive versus descriptive, right? Genesis one and two are prescriptive, and Lamech why? is descriptive, and why? that's exactly my point. Is why, and I want us to understand that. And I'm gonna maybe sound. I'm gonna pull from my inner. Um, um, appreciation from Dan McClellan here, where he makes the, the, he says, we have to negotiate, people negotiate these texts, right? The idea is that it doesn't say, hey, Genesis 2, all right, reader, this is an all time forever moral objective law. Okay, Lamech, uh, guys, don't do this. I'm just making a bigger point. They don't say that. We have to negotiate. Why don't we follow certain Levitical laws, but we highlight other ones? And it's, and the answer is, it's complicated, and depending on what Christian tradition you're a That's part right. of, you're going to get right. different results. You just are. That's right. And so the last thing I'll say is the next objection I would hear is, well, Tim, if the Bible isn't the standard for marriage, then what is? And I would say, well, just like how we don't look at the Bible for supporting slavery anymore, we can certainly make other arguments for why what marriage is today is so good and right and great without pulling from the biblical text about what they describe some kind of sexual relationship to be between the sexes, right? So the Bible has plenty of things that we look at today and we say, whoa, I this is not a good application. 
No, I don't think we should invade other countries and slaughter all the women and children. Bad. That, that's a bad take. Now, it's in there. We have to wrestle with the text. What is it getting at? What's going on there? We don't ignore it, but we don't take that as, well, God has given me this calling. In fact, I would go even so far as to say, as some Christians have in the past, it's called the Doctrine of Discovery. And it ended in very bad, evil, terrible ways, right? So I think we have to be just very, very um, careful and we have to be thoughtful and we have to use wisdom and we have to wrestle and we have to rely on the community around us to think about, okay, what do we do with this beautiful, sacred, complicated, messy, complicated book, right? And what do we do with it today in our way, as Scott McKnight would say, and push for a better future that promotes human flourishing, that promotes, I would argue, an inclusive model of, no, the blessing of God is being expanded outward, okay? It's not going more exclusive. It's going more inclusive. Those are the questions you have to wrestle with. I'm not going to tell you how to see those things. Certainly the world is complicated, but I think, uh, Jen, frankly, your arguments are very compelling, and I appreciate you sharing them with the class today. <laughs> I appreciate you having me on to talk about it with you, Tim, and really to talk about it with you, truly. Now, you go live on Tuesdays and Thursdays on your own channel, right? Right, I do. Yeah. What's, Tuesdays, your, what's just, your channel called? Well, it's just me. My channel is just Jennifer Bird PhD, and it's one of my, yeah, so I just have a, um, yeah, just a playlist in there. But it's, um, what it's, what these are is Storytime Live. So it's, um, I'm doing, I'm reading through biblical passages, both testaments that address topics such as sex, there you the go. relationship we call marriage. Yeah, if you'll go to playlists, yeah. Um, you can see the- um, All the details story are here. Storytime, yep, Storytime, Sex, Marriage. I need to change the name of that. At I'm Jennifer Bird, PhD, friends. That's yes, what you're looking at here. You. Make yeah. sure you follow. Yeah. Okay. And actually, I just want to, if I can, very quickly, I know you're trying Go to wrap ahead. up. No, you're good. Tuesday, I actually read through um, the laws in Leviticus 18, partly in prep for this conversation, which we didn't even get to talk about, and that's okay. Um, but I did Storytime Live on Leviticus 18, and I pulled a whole bunch of shorts from it because I, there's just so many things about the way those laws tell us the way people thought about mm. bodies and sex that I think mm. is really important to this larger conversation. But yeah. I don't want to open that. I just want to let you know that's out there. If people are interested in my take on Leviticus 18, awesome. um, it was the story time live on Tuesday. Yeah. Great. Well, friends, listen, thank you so much again for hanging in there. Another two hour live, uh, not as long as my record with Billy, uh, but this was certainly an important conversation. If you like our channel, please give us a subscribe, give us a like. I will try and save all of these live stream comments in the video last time that they weren't in there, but there were so many good ones, over 240 comments. So I'll try and make sure I get that in here and we'll talk to you all next time. Thanks for hanging in. Talk to you all later on.